excited to see everybody here. The library is full. Um, this is our first, let's say, real big event. We've got people on Zoom um, and a full house here. My name is Jared McCormick. I'm a clinical assistant professor here in the Kevorkian Center, um, and I'm delighted to welcome you. So I'm going to just do some brief introductions and then um, turn it over. So <clears throat> this is a conversation about making space for the Gulf, histories of regionalism in the Middle East. And this is not a book talk. This is, let's call it a, a springboard. This is using Arang's book, um, bringing in some other esteemed colleagues to have a conversation. I also just want to let people know this is, we have... Um, the first year PhD and master's students, Problems and Methods, is also kind of dovetailing with this. They're in the classroom too. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just by way of very short introductions for all of them, um, Aren Keshavarzian is the associate professor and the department chair of MEIS. Um, his interests focus on Iran and the Persian Gulf, clearly as we're gonna hear about, but it spans the region. He has published widely, um, and this most recent book from the spring, um, which will kind of be the, the center anchor of, of the conversation. And I also just want to add that he is um, a very thoughtful and caring administrator that um, he deserves a, a lot of, of applause in, in that regard. Um, Natasha Iskandar is the James Weldon Johnson Professor of Urban Planning and Public Service. She's also the founder and the director of the NYU Migration Network. Um, I would just say how I understand her work in short are all of the constellations of migration, ramifications, intersections, and her most recent work, does skill make us human? Migrant workers in the 21st century, Qatar and beyond, from Princeton University Press in 2021, examines the use of skill categories to define political personhood. Um, she is a friend of both MEIS and Kivo. We're delighted to have you here. Okay, yeah, we. I, I heard it, so we, we yes. And finally, Ali Mirsapasi, he is the Albert Gallatin Research Excellence Professor of Middle East and Islamic Studies. He is the director of the Iranian Studies Initiative here at NYU, and he is prolific. Um, he uh, really, uh, I don't want to say puts us all to shame, but I will not list the, all of his works, but... Perhaps the, the most recent, and this is for, for the students, because this is on the syllabus for, for suggested reading, uh, The Loneliest Revolution, A Memoir of Solidarity and Struggle in Iran. Um, great. And since, since I'm throwing in a little personal thing, I also want to say um, Ali is always a mentor and a guide for junior scholars, and I have seen it time and time again. So all three of them, um, we're forming a conversation about a region here. We're delighted to have you. And so just by way of the structure, Arang is going to speak for maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then uh, Natasha and Ali will kind of weigh in with some thoughts. We'll think about things up here. And then there will be plenty of time for conversation and thoughts from the audience. And finally, there will be a small reception, hopefully by 7.15, food, conversation. Um, so without, let's just start. Thank you, Jared, for those uh, very kind words. Um, the ceiling is below. Um, there, just, I know everyone doesn't want to sit in the front row, but you should know there's plenty of space in the front row. If you're, those of you in the back, if you're uncomfortable, please come up to the front. So let me uh, begin with thank yous, uh, because there are many of them that I, uh, do, that I owe to uh, several folks that made uh, this all possible. So let me first thank the Kevorkian Center for organizing this event, uh, in particular, Mohamed Bazi, uh, Jared McCormick, Tyson, uh, Fidel, Amanda, uh, Andrea, and Sage, um, who have all helped 
make all of this, uh, all of these chairs so ni nice and neat, uh, made all the technology work, sent out all the emails and everything. I know there's a lot of labor that goes into every single one, every single event here at the Kevorkian. Um, but it's also a pleasure to have an opportunity to, uh, to discuss my book with two wonderful scholars and good friends. Uh, thank you, uh, Natasha and Ali, for accepting this invitation. Um, I hope they know that their their own writings, research, and the many conversations I've had to, uh, I've had with them have shaped the way I think about um, the Persian Gulf, the way I think about Iranian history, and many many other topics. Um, and they've always been so. Uh, uh, so generous in their support. Finally, um, it's particularly meaningful, me meaningful for me that this is a sort of hybrid Iranian studies Kivo events um, that, that brings us together. Um, because uh, in many senses, Kivo or this building, MEIS Kivo and the ISI has been my intellectual home the past 15 years or so, and the intellectual home of this project itself. So the book draws on and builds on um, a whole series of events, panels, uh, film screenings that ISI has or organized over these past years. And there's echoes of that in, in the way I think about these topics. And uh, uh, as importantly, if not more importantly, the graduate students in the MA program in the Kevorkian and the graduate students in the PhD program in MEIS over the past um, 15 years or so, 10 years or so, have deeply informed the way I think about um, this book. It's without their um, oftentimes um, uh, patient engagement with some of these topics, listening to me trot out some of these ideas, uh, I don't think the book would have even been published. So I learned a lot from their own thinking about various topics, thinking about space, thinking about labor, thinking about identity. I learned a lot from their seminar papers, their MA theses, their PhD dissertations, some of which will be published in the coming uh, months and years. So with that, let me begin. Uh, my book examines the Persian Gulf and what it means for this body of water to be turned into a region. To think about this, not only did I have to contend with the rich and varied histories of port cities, commodities, and people who have settled in or circulated through the Gulf and its environs, but I had to think about geography, space, and place anew. I had to move away from thinking of regions as enclosed things, or geographies as timeless, or space as merely a passive stage on which action takes place. Instead, I hope I have been able to convince the reader uh, of this book that it is constructive to think, about, think of place, places, and the Persian Gulf as dynamic, social, and unbounded, or to adopt what the late British geographer Doreen Massey calls an extroverted sense of place. It took me a long time to write this book, and there were uh, several stops and starts, second guesses, reorientations, but I was ultimately motivated to write, write it to make sense of what I've come to think of as a puzzle or a tension. The Gulf is both highly concrete, but also incredibly elusive. The Persian Gulf is, some, uh, is something that is at once a highly tangible and, uh, and, and highly specific. We can identify it on the map. We can identify cities, ports, and social communities that live on its shores and depend on the, on the life worlds that it sustains uh, and, this uh, and the body uh, of water that, um, that shapes it. In the past 20 to 30 years, we have an increasing number of conferences, books, associations, and journals dedicated to the study of the Gulf. And more and more students want to take classes on this region, on this area. Governments, think tanks, academics, and others have invested in the idea of so-called Gulf cities, Gulf culture, Gulf studies, and, uh, and presented as somehow distinct from other places. Um, in fact, I should just a little anecdote. Just this weekend, I got to go with my son to Alphabet City and see a golf music concert, right? Where Boucheri, a very famous, wonderful Boucheri musician, was playing right here on Avenue A. Something um, I wonder could have happened or would have been advertised as such uh, a few years ago. But at the same time, the golf is obscure, vague, and contested. There is no consensus as to what is inside or outside of it. Is Iraq part of the, of, of the Persian Gulf? 
is Yemen part of that Persian Gulf, Pakistan, India, so on and so forth. For some, it is a sea. Uh, for some, uh, it is a sea that has functioned for centuries as a transmission belt, facilitating the flow of people, commodities, and ideas. For some, the Gulf is a border, a border between states and civilizations. Yet for others, it's a frontier zone where empires collide and wealth can be extracted from bountiful energy sources. And if it's all of these things, how and why can they sit side by side? What co contradictions and ten tensions are revealed by this multiplicity? Rather than trying to adjudicate what understanding of the Persian Gulf is more accurate or more true, in the book, I try to make sense of how these different conceptions of and aspirations for the Gulf have emerged across time and from different vantage points. I do so to ponder what it reveals to us about the Gulf's relationships, relationships to other places, social processes, and political projects, ranging from imperialism, nationalism, and capitalist extraction and, and accumulation. Now, it is for this reason that the book thinks of the Persian Gulf as a process rather than a fixed object or abstract space, and regionalism as an outcome rather than, uh, rather than a given that exists prior to society or prior to the social. And once we adopt this process-driven and relational approach to space, I contend um, that not only does the Gulf appear as multiple, but also a ge it appears as a, as a geographic scale that intersects with other spatial politics and scales, urbanism, uh, imperialism, internationalism, nationalism, or the global, and so forth. This allows us to see movement along, alongside of immobility, commodification alongside of dispossession, and treat the Gulf as uneven, variegated, and differentiated. Importantly, it requires us to think in terms of space and time together, space-time. The structure of the book is designed to emphasize uh, these points with the narrative being organized in a non-chronological or teleological fashion. Instead, I organize the book in terms of geographic scale, from the imperial to the nation state, to the scale of free trade zones, and the scale of the urban, the chapter that some of you read uh, for this uh, session. This allows me to emphasize multiplicity, simultaneity, and how region making intersects with and is recruited for other types of spatialized politics. So the chapters work recursively with certain historical moments appearing more than in, in more than one chapter. And the narrative, I like to think, folds in and on itself. Okay. Um, Sage, can I ask you to go to the next? No, nope, one more. Thank you. So after the introduction, the narrative of the book, of the book begins by examining the social, economic, and political forces at play on the cusp of the 19th century. It emphasizes the role of ecology and the overlapping and cross-cutting nature of political power, as well as the socioeconomic interdependence of people and places. It does, it, it does, to show, it does this to show how the Gulf was geographically unbounded and socially fluid despite and because of social hierarchies and deep economic inequalities. Chapter two looks at regionalism from the imperial scale. It investigates how this unbounded regionalism was overwritten by an aspiration to turn it into an enclosed and an externally secured geopolit geopolitical zone, first by the British Empire and then through US hegemony and military supremacy. Divided Sovereignties, chapter three, returns to the late 19th century, but does, does so to examine how projects for, uh, to build independent nation states intersected with imperial formations and how they carried with them new notions of the Gulf, Arabian, Persian, so on and so forth, for instance. And also how people now classified as citizens, nationals, foreigners, migrants, and so forth, could move uh, across a region that was shot through with state boundaries, racial markers, class distinctions, and political coalitions. Chapter four explores regionalism 
and its uh, conflictual place in the world of states and global capitalism. I examined the genealogy of free trade zones, specifically the free trade zone of Kish, uh, Kish Island off of, uh, off of the coast of Iran, as well as Jebel Ali on the border between Dubai and Abu, uh, Abu Dhabi. To, uh, I do this to both critique our understandings of globalism, uh, the, the sophomoric understanding of the, the world being flat, but also to historicize in new narratives about neoliberalism and the place of the Gulf within um, uh, neoliberal capitalism. Chapter five, uh, titled Urbanism Rebounded, um, again, the ones that some of the students read, asks what it means for the for Gulf cities to be global cities and what sorts of understandings of regionalism are evoked while cities are built and sustained. Now, I, I conclude the book by foregrounding the human scale and how it reveals both the social intercourse made possible by regionalism and the conflicts and gaps in ideas about regionalism. Let me end with something from the conclusion and by giving you a feel for my approach to the studying of the Gulf and how it intersects with multiple scales. I'm gonna share a brief anecdote. It appears in the conclusion of the book and the events go back to more than 20 years ago. But now that I've finished the project, I've come to understand these, these anecdotes as a sort of the, the origin story for the entire project or what motiv motiv motivated me to actually think about the Gulf in, in these particular ways. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an anecdote about two trips that I made to the, the coast uh, of the Gulf, of the Gulf uh, a few months apart in the early parts of 2001. Um, yes, one more map. Okay, next slide. Okay, I'm sorry, it's kind of small for those in the back. But hopefully some of you can see that. Um, I had been living in Iran for several months and in January, I drove from Shiraz to Bandar Abbas, and then the nearby port city, uh, cities and islands of Qashm and Kish. I was motivated by the previous, my previous project on the Tehran Bazaar and interested in questions about commerce. One early morning, my, fellow, uh, my two fellow travel, travelers and I went to a small jetty in uh, Charak or Bandar Charak, which is a small town which is adjacent to the very important 19th century port city of Lenge. We boarded a motorboat to travel to the island of Kish. Kish was, it was and is a free trade zone, and in fact, uh, was one of the uh, oldest such free trade zone projects in the entire Persian Gulf uh, region. And this is what I discuss in chapter four of the book. As we sat waiting, uh, uh, waiting in a rickety vessel, which was drenched with the smell of gasoline, um, I noticed a group of about two dozen men, women, and children waiting near the jetty. From their clothing, it seemed that they were quote unquote locals and from humble backgrounds. And given that they had sprawled out under the limited shade, I surmised that they were expecting to be waiting for a long time. I knew that the so-called locals living in the quote unquote border region were allotted special import passes to bring goods from, the, from economic zones. So I interpreted this site as a mission to travel to Kish and bring uh, uh, consumer goods back to the so-called mainland. I never found out if I was correct, but I suspected that these people were organized by so-called parachuters or smugglers who conscripted farmers and their families uh, into coordinated operations to transfer goods back from the coast to the Iranian plateau, to cities like Shiraz, Esfahan, and, uh, and Tehran. In fact, when I returned to Kish a few days later, uh, when I returned from Kish a few days later and drove back towards Shiraz, we had to navigate a gauntlet of checkpoints set up, by, set, set up to stymie illegal trade, um, or at least allow officials of the state to take a cut from the lucrative trade uh, networks. We also noticed a shrine where smugglers would visit to make donations, something that Fariba Adel Kha would confirm in her subsequent ethno ethnography, ethnographic study of diaspor diasporic Iranian communities. But as we drove through the town of Bastak, here's that, 
is circled in red, um, a good distance away from um, Charak and Kish. Um, as we drove through the town of Bastak, where we, no uh, we noticed perfectly resurfaced roads, spotless bathrooms, and well-stocked bakals or grocery stores. Can you skip to the next slide? I would later discover that these, that uh, discover that this was thanks to several centuries of circular migration between Bastak and Eastern Arabia, and specifically Dubai. And this is discussed in chapter two of the book. Now, Dubai was my second visit to the Gulf, four, and it happened four months after this, and, uh, this trip to Quiche. Um, I travel, uh, uh, I approached this, uh, the, uh, I approached uh, Dubai, uh, the port city of uh, Dubai, not by car, not by ship or by Dow, but instead by an airplane. I witnessed more scenes of groups of people sprawled out waiting. The terminal protected them from the sun and the heat, but, the, but in Dubai's airport, they had to negotiate the cold air conditioning with the help of shawls and blankets. It's an image of men and women just in an airport terminal. As I moved through the terminal with my American passport, I exchanged pleasantries in Persian with Emirati passport control officers. Meanwhile, the large number of men I presumed to be from South Asia were directed to the inner bowels of the airport to have their paperwork and permits inspected and reviewed. Um, there were, these were the people who would construct Dubai's spectacular built environment that was well underway uh, even in 2001. Probably classified as unskilled, probably classified uh, as, as unskilled as Natasha Iskander has, uh, has, has taught us, and under, understood by Emirati policymakers as quote unquote temporary, these men and women would help expand and operate one of the largest man-made ports in the world, Jebel Ali, which was one of the conduits for the smuggling of commodities to Iran. They would also clean the offices of holding companies and Fortune 500 firms, and they would take care of the, child, uh, of the children of jet setters and nurse the sick back to health. One day in the midst of conducting interviews with Iranian uh, businessmen, I stumbled upon Bastakia. Could you uh, actually click on me? Oh, a couple more times. One more, there you go. I stumbled upon Bastakia. This was a heritage village commemorating some of the oldest homes in the port city of Dubai. Completely devoid of visitors, Emirati or otherwise, the pristine homes in the small neighborhood were named after Bastak, the city that I drove through a few months prior. In, uh, in the early 20th century, the neighborhood in, in Dubai was home to merchants from the city of Bastak or the town of Bastak and its surrounding villages. They had migrated from Fars in southern Iran to escape, this, escape conscription, increased taxes, and the general expansion of Tehran's reach into their daily lives. They came to Dubai because they had pre-existing ties. They had family, they had credit, they had trading partners, and much more. This was less a story of people being uprooted than people having multiple roots. Since then, the old, quote unquote, old residential neighborhood in Dubai has been re renamed as the uh, uh, Fahadi Historical Neighborhood. It's wind towers uh, and building materials that evoke an Indian Ocean littoral society are now deployed to signify Emirati culture uh, and are part of a repertoire uh, of ways to preserve authenticity and national belonging. It does this to both disavow the histories of heterogeneity, empire, and political struggle, all important parts of what I discuss in chapter two and three, but by doing all this in the midst of all the branding of Dubai as, uh, and the Gulf as global, these renovated buildings are, uh, are a means to defend the so-called national from the ravages of the, quote, demographic imbalance, that imbalances and threats that many in the Emirates feel that they are confronting. Dubai, Doha, and Abu Dhabi, and other oil, uh, oil wealth-fueled uh, cities that recruited PR firms and architectural companies to package their ur urbanism as global are equally anxious about retaining their localism. 
They have sought to turn their past into heritage and to turn their history into a, into a fixed object. In the process, they've tried to efface and erase any possibility for the regional to be lived in the present. And, and this is why we have to resist fixed and exclusionary understandings of the Gulf if we want to envision alternative futures for the Gulf as well as the world. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Hivo for hosting this. The oh, sorry, I moved to the podium and then I don't use the microphone. Um, I, I want to thank I, I want to thank um, I want to thank the organizers of this event for inviting me. I want to thank Arang for writing this beautiful book. Um, I, I have a few comments, but before I I start, I want to promise you that I did not consult with Arang before writing these because the um, parallels are um, jarring. I don't know if it's because we're neighbors, the vibes traveled or, or what. Last year, a couple of months after I read Arang's brilliant book, I went to the Dubai Museum, which is housed in a cluster of traditional adobe houses near the Al Fahidi Fort at the edge of town. Right? The museum exhibits, the mu museum features exhibits representing the history of Dubai, and the Gulf broadly, with each house capturing a sliver of Dubai's making in a manner that reminded me of the chapters in Arang's beautiful book. One house told the story of pearling in the Gulf, another told the story of oil, another told the story of the headlong construction of Dubai, and so on. I say that the homes were reminiscent of Arang's, books, of Arang's book, but the resemblance was actually only passing. Yes, the history of the Gulf's making was told thematically, much as Arang does. But as if by design, the exhibit enacted many of the layered and contested processes of region making that Arang so adeptly and so insightfully describes in Making Space for the Gulf. It's almost as if Arang's book had gifted me with a kind of second sight a new perspective, so that as I walked through the exhibit, what jumped out at me was the making, the many pushes and pulls, the gestures, the power plays that were folded into the seamless narrative that the exhibit strove to present. This is the gift that a good book gives, a new register of perception. Let me offer an example. One of the first houses I entered was the Purling House. Each of the small rooms of the courtyard and majlis displayed a diorama of an aspect of the pearling industry, complete with the relevant artifacts and a narrative history on the wall, or maybe a map, again, enacting Arang's uh, book. <laughs> One diorama showed a pearling boat manned by clay figurines surrounded by photos of pearling dives from the 1920s and 30s. The text told us that the relations on the Dow were collaborative, with everyone working together to fish the precious gems during the day and in the evening praying, singing, and sharing a meal. The prevalence of forced labor in the form of debt bondage or enslavement and the injuries that the divers suffered were left completely out of the story. In another room, the diorama was made of two traders sitting cross-legged on a carpet, negotiating the price of a pearl hall with hand gestures under a kerchief that kept the final prices hidden from onlookers. The accompanying text said nothing about how the price of pearls and the industry as a whole was imbricated in thick webs of finance that span the globe with money changing hands from Mumbai to Paris. In the final display, the entire literal of the Gulf covered a wall and circles of light appeared and widened off the black line that illustrated the coast to indicate the time and size of the harvest over the course of the year from Muscat to Ahmadi. But missing completely from the map was Qatar. The Qatari coast, the site of the richest pearling beds in the Gulf was not illuminated. It was dark and completely absent from the board. 
so that even the location of oysters' nests was made through the kinds of struggles that Arang describes with all the petty rivalries between modern Gulf countries. The Gulf, uh, the Gulf that, the, the Gulf that uh, the Dubai Museum represented was as Arang described the region, the making of that exhibit, a mutable created space that does not exist as a passive stage, but is assembled, and here I'm quoting, but is assembled out of human actions and relations, including those of the curators, as well as being constitutive of struggles. Arang writes that for Persian and Arab nationalists, history is something to purify or escape. In this museum, history had been purified rendered to create an origin story for Dubai and the UAE as a timeless Arab city and civilization, rooted and authentic, with only the neighbors that it liked. But that version of history was just one salvo in the back and forth of competing histories that Arang describes, histories of coercion and exploitation, connection and possibility, geopolitical jockeying, new technologies, new horizons, imaginaries of space, new infrastructures, and new conceptions of societies. Time, place, histories of belonging and bordering. The history of the Gulf's making that Arang offers us is polyphonic and unsettled. It foregrounds the agency of actors and the way they pull against each other. Arang brings erasures to the fore but also tells us the story of why those erasures seemed so necessary. And he does this, and this is to me really striking, with profound compassion for and understanding of the various forces and actors at play, engaging with their worldview and their objectives. This kind of historical and geographical writing is exceptional, exceptionally difficult to do. And Arang does it elegantly and compellingly. Each of his chapters captures a layer drawn with rich detail, but also with a critical eye. You can see this in the brilliant chapter that many of you read for today, where he illustrates how social borders are drawn in physical space. To me, it's as if we were looking, as a garment, at, looking at a garment. Before, we just saw a wool suit. But after reading Arang's book, we are now able to see in our mind's eye the tailor at work but also the weaver of the wool, the shepherd in the field, the tanker that took the suit packed in a container across the ocean into a state-of-the-art port at the edge of a free trade zone to be worn in the office of a building designed by a star architect, where the carpets are vacuumed nightly by a migrant arrived from far away who sleeps on a cot in a dilapidated building at the far edge of the gleaming city. This is how all histories should be told. Arang gives us a beautiful, sensitive history, not of the Gulf, but of its making, which will become the must read for anyone who wants to understand the region. But he also gives us a method. He shows us how to write history that is contingent, contested, multivocal, so that all of the stakes are visible, all of the messy, agentic action, all of the power struggles, even the ugly ones, especially the ugly ones, and he does this with a kind of elegiac attention to all of it. Um, this afternoon, I was reading a beautiful interview in Merit with Elias Khoury, who passed away. Uh, and in it was a quote from Gates of the Sun, one of his masterful novels. History has dozens of versions. And for it to ossify into only one leads to death. Arang writes the history of many versions, the history of life, the history of the living present, the history where the seams are visible. This matters because it foregrounds all the possibilities for action in the past, present, and future, and shows how those possibilities widen and close as people interact, struggle, collaborate, how they shift the ways that people understand themselves, invent pasts and imagine futures. To understand the significance of this method, we must ask ourselves what kinds of possibilities for action and interpretation become available and deployable when we apply it? What happens when we abandon, as Arang so powerfully encourages us to do, the idea that history is a trajectory, 
And when we come to see it as everything all at once, all the time, pushing and pulling and becoming, what kind of politics become newly possible? And um, we were encouraged to think of a question for the author. And so to the author, I want to ask, what kinds of politics become newly possible? Thank you. First of all, thank you, Natasha, for a beautiful <laughs> a presentation. Um, 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 and very inspiring and, uh, and a great question. Um, I also would like to thank everyone who has been involved in this wonderful event. And of course, thank you. First of all, I am when I heard that your book is out, it was a big relief. I have been waiting for 20 years since for the book. <laughs> and um, and um, Orang is a, um, a, a good friend and colleague. And we have collaborated and we worked together. But contrary to what he said, he, is very, he has been very private about this book. I, my only knowledge of this book was when he gave a talk at Princeton. So um, we often meet and talk about many things, academic and otherwise. Um, I, I don't think I ever heard of him talking about the book. He, ha he talks about the trips he makes or plans he has. But, um, but again, except for one talk, he has been very private. And I have been waiting at least for 15 years. Well, you mentioned 2001, just 21 years or 20 whatever years. I'm not good in numbers, but it's quite a long time. Uh, but reading the book, obviously, I... Microphone? I thought I'm already loud. Um, uh, it's such a precious book. It's such an excellent read. Um, I, I have limited time. I, um, I want to just read what I have here. Otherwise, I can go on and on and on. So um, maybe some of the phrases I will privately um, share with you. Uh, but... Um, 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 I have to preface by saying that these two colleagues are scholars of the Gulf, and uh, I am not. I'm not. I don't even follow the scholarship about the Gulf, except for in general terms. So, um, and my 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 comments and questions reflect that. So I I just decided to <laughs> say a few things about. Um, areas that I, at least I think I know uh, something about. I found the, um, the book's scholarly approach rather novel. It's clearly very original and theoretically very both exciting and thought provoking, which I will share some of those um, um, here with you. Reading the book is right, reading the book is evident that this is a well researched and theoretically valuable text just by itself, outside of the um, the history and empirical work. Although you know, of course, um, those are um, also great. It is also clear that Arang's present uh, Arang presents his ideas in a rather fresh and original way. I, I don't want to repeat myself, but what I value about this text is how daring and, um, and intellectually um, exciting his discussions are, including discussion of both history and place. 
one may say that his arguments in a few instances, although really it's in, it is in more than few instances, are rather counterintuitive and perhaps challenges, this was certainly true with me, the reader's already established view of the Persian Gulf. Uh, I think Natasha also um, made comments on this. As a reader of this book with no expertise, as I said, in the Gulf, I would like to offer a few comments and questions. Um, to save time, I am basically making my comments and also questions at the same time. Let's see if I can do that. Um, my, my comments and questions concern Arang's argument, I found both intellectually very appealing, um, and I hope uh, it, they appear as such, but I'm also curious and would like to hear more from him. In other words, my questions are not, I'm not really challenging him, first of all, because again, I don't have expertise about the Gulf and uh, I'm not in that position. But at the same time, I really want to hear more. I have to say your presentation, at least partially, um, addresses some of the um, some of the areas that I wanted to do more. But nevertheless, I have written what I will read what I have written here. So these are three set of questions and comments, uh, comments and questions. Number one. It seems that the book engages in the constructing of the Persian Gulf mapping over time. Uh, it's um, the construction of both the place and time. The book calls for bridging of the two main parts of the region, north and south. At the same time, it seems at least this is my reading of the book, that it, um, it argues for imagining the Gulf as an unbounded geography. Natasha brilliantly um, presented that argument. Now, this part of the Arang's argument in the book seems to be primarily critique of global capitalism and its tendency to create an even economic development and close status politics, pol political structure in the Gulf. However, it is not completely clear how the methodology professing to celebrate pluralism and, and um, an unbounded or uh, and changing boundaries um, in the Gulf presents an alternative to these modern politics. Um, although that is what the author claims in the book. This is really the question that, um, that Natasha asked at the end. What would be the politics of seeing everything in such a state of fluidity? Number two, the book calls, and this is, I'm coding uh, Arang, for replacing the naturalized understanding of the Gulf, Gulf and it also indicates, it's, it's a code again, the book, it aims to break down the common definition of the goal, uh, common, common definition as a space historically and geographically divided between Arabs and Iran. This text also argues that the Gulf is rather historically 
and anthropologically how people live that is one region with, which has been traversed by multiple and continuing changing transnational linkage. Uh, Arang, you already in your introduction indicated that. The implication of this argument might be that the region really is one unified place. Uh, Arang does not make that argument, and one can even argue that makes counter argument to what I just said. But this, uh, this is, I, at least I see this as one line of reasoning or line of argument in, in the book. However, modern realities, this is also what is argued in the book, that modern realities of European empire, US geopolitics, and capitalism, development of capitalism, as, as we discussed earlier, have increasingly divided region into two, um, in, uh, among fixed nation states. So there are these two counter tendencies going at the same time. We might ask if it is helpful to reduce the idea of nation states to simply new incarnation of the old imperial politics. One might also argue that this book is foremost an Iranian view of the world. Um, and this is reference to the Gulf as a unified um, space, if, um, if my reading is correct on that. Would other scholars, say scholars from the Gulf, from other parts of the Arab world, our colleague Sinan Anton is here, I would love to hear from him, would argue with or with the author's attempt to picture the Gulf as, as such either fluid space or a unified community. Third and last um, comment and question. Another key argument of the book seems to be the issue of promoting local agency, which I love and you write, um, your prose is, is excellent and I, I enjoy just reading it, but, um, but I would like to, to also pose a question. In the past and present time, the dominant world powers have defined the Gulf region as having fixed boundaries and well understood dynamics. This is what the book argues. The book also offers, by contrast, a complex history of space with shifting contours and permeable boundaries in which, in which live realities and contingencies that are dynamic and have frequently frustrated statist and closed projects of those in power whether local or external. Now, my question and my last comment. If this is the case, as the book argues, then what are the implications of such an argument? Is the book arguing that the actual lived experience of population in the Gulf involves resistance to imperial power, both in the past and in current situation. This is really another way of asking the question that Natasha asked, the politics. Can we argue this? Can, we, can one make this argument about agency of people who live in the Gulf? At the same time that we more or less see at least politically stable situation in the Persian Gulf. Thank you.
everyone can see if we're still seated, I think, right? If we stay seated, that, that works. Um, okay, uh, tough questions. Um, <laughs> First of all, thank you both for reading the, the book so closely and uh, presenting its um, ideas so eloquently. I, I really appreciate that. Um, but uh, you've asked, I mean, I, I don't think I, in, in order not to take all of the time, let me, the main question you're at, you're all, both of you are, are pointing to is, well, this is all nice and well to challenge uh, our accepted notions of the Gulf, um, but what sort of a politics can emerge if the Gulf is multiple, it's diffuse, it's fluid, um, and it, it, regardless that people want to continuously bound it, have aspirations for enclosing it, nonetheless, we, it always ends up being unbounded in some way because it depends, it depends on those interactions, those relationships to the outside world. You know, it depends on agricultural goods coming from Africa to feed all those people living in, in the cities. It depends on labor from all across the world to build the high rises and all that. So, so what sorts of politics can, can emerge? Um, and yeah, I, so, I, I sort of dodged the question, I think, in the, both in the intro and the conclusion by saying, well, you know, history is contingent and, you know, things are not, and it's not inevitable and things can happen and, you know, and, and I, I leave it a bit like that. So I agree that I've sort of, this is not a political manifesto uh, in, in that respect, but, but it is an important question. How I've been thinking about it kind of after the, I've written the book is, is, the, is, the, is the following. A um, couple, let me make in two different ways, and then maybe some of you in the audience can help me. Um, one, one, one lens that I've been thinking about it is that while I was finishing this book, it's quite clear we're in, we're in an age where globalism is actually quite tarnished, right? Ever since the 2008 economic recession, various forms or another, from the right, from the left, there's been critiques of globalism, neoliberalism, uh, uh, the global elites uh, disparaged uh, by anti-Semites and you know, all different types. So there, there is, we're in a world where in, in a sense there's a, uh, there's an insular in, in, uh, insular uh, kind of lens. Uh, the other day I was saying, you know, when I arrived at NYU, everything was global, the global network, global network, this. But we hardly, and when we go to chairs meetings, they almost never mention the global network university. And our latest campus is NYU Tulsa, right? So it's the epitome of the return to the nation, right? Uh, e even by people who disparage Donald Trump and so forth, yet it is how do we how do we support Amer democracy in America and so forth? So there's this insular dynamic in Iran right now. If those of you are following, it's quite clear that, that many the Iranian government, but also many Iranians, would love to basically expel all the Afghani's from the country, right? So this is this is this this tendency is is everywhere uh, in many different types of politics, in many different types of political cultures. There is this attempt to protect the nation from outside threats. So this, so this has led me to think, okay, so if, if globalism is, is sort of, we can't go there because it's so, such a, a checkered and sullied uh, history, and if nationalism comes with such parochialism and viciousness and so forth, maybe in a sense the reason I'm grappling to try to think in terms of region and regionalism is, is that it's, it's, it's a way to get people to think beyond their narrow national confines, but, but also think in terms of the people that they interact with. You know, whether Emiratis or Iranians like it or not, they have to interact with Afghanis and South Asians and Turks and you know, non-Muslims and so on and so forth. So regionalism politically could be a useful category to allow us to think about pluralism and difference and interaction. So that's you know, that's one way you know to think is that there maybe there is for someone out there there is a, a politics of regionalism that could capture both the challenges that many people are facing around around the world, but also um, create the 
facilitate the sorts of collaboration that's necessary to move beyond it. And when I say that, here I am thinking about climate change, massive toxicity in, in the region, right? So if those of you do follow Gulf News, whether it's, I mean, the record-breaking heats that we've had the last few weeks in some of these places on both, both sides of the, 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 the lake, uh, uh, sandstorms, polluted rivers and arteries and stuff. These are huge problems. I mean, obviously the whole world is grappling with it, but the, this immediate region of the Gulf is intimately, uh, uh, has to you know, directly deal with uh, the ravages of climate change. And it's so obvious that there's no way to do this within the confines and the containers called the nation state. It's just impossible when you know, Iraq and Iran, Iran cannot manage polluted waterways and, and air and all of these things in isolation. Um, uh, overfishing in the Persian Gulf and the Indian Ocean, you can't do it as an individual. So it's begging for meaningful regional uh, engagement, diplomacy, collaboration by scientists, right? I, sometimes I imagine, so if you have to gather all this data, these scientists actually have to work across the borders. Um, so, so again, we have to think about some category other than the nation and other than, than this large category called the global, which has been weaponized and abused in so many different ways for the better part of the last three decades. Um, so it wasn't a very, and it wasn't a, it wasn't a full answer to your question, but that's, that's where I'm in a sense groping for. I'm, I'm wondering is, can there be a politics of uh, regionhood or regionalism that is, um, this, that is emancipatory? Um, and, 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 you know, maybe I, I don't know Latin American society and history and politics, but you can, from afar, I get the sense that in Latin America, there is this groping for this, how do we kind of, uh, how do we work together? In Asia, there's some of this. So part of the decline of the US that has been happening very slowly for the past three decades, I think many parts of the world are thinking of how do we take care of ourselves when the global hegemon is so exploitative, incompetent, pernicious, and so interested in being, in, uh, prim you know, it's primacy. So we, we get glimpses of, of this when we look at regional politics, at least when I read about regional politics international, but there are moments of hope in some of this. So that's maybe wishful thinking, but I, I would like to think there are some smart folks in this class and in this room can think about um, a, a politics of regionalism that is um, that will show us, give us answers to the many problems that we have. Um, no, I mean, I, uh, I really want to go to Dubai and check out the, this new, uh, the new museum. Um, there is, I mean, for the, the, the folks looking for a research project out there, there's a lot of good work being done on heritage, including by our colleagues, us, this is, uh, but the Gulf is ripe for this critical reading of museums and, 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 uh, public, uh, branding campaigns and, public relations uh, um, uh, projects and stuff, uh, Neom and all these sorts of things. And once you start looking at them, they are just so narrow, they have such a narrow understanding of, of history, of the region, of, of, of uh, identity in these things. So there are a lot of good, uh, important projects to be done. Great, thank you. Um why don't you all keep the mic and we will turn it over to questions in the audience. So just raise your hand and we have a mic in the front and the back. Abu 